Well, on the night of the 21st of September, 1823, a teenage boy by the name of Joseph Smith was praying in his bedroom in a home in western New York. Later, he would publish a book uh, describing what he claims he experienced at that time. He said, while I was thus in the act of calling upon God, I discovered a light in my room, which continued to increase until the room was lighter than at noonday, when immediately a personage appeared at my bedside, standing in the air, for his feet did not touch the floor. According to Joseph Smith, this was an angel identified as the angel Moroni. Uh, Moroni said that he himself had been a, a human being, a human warrior from an ancient American civilization, and he was the son of a man called Mormon. When Moroni died in battle, he became an angel, and now he was being tasked with uh, keeping safe a set of golden plates that were inscribed with special revelation from God. And he had been sent to lead Joseph Smith to find these plates and to translate them and to begin a new religion that would become known as uh, the Church of Latter-day Saints of Jesus Christ. The Church of Latter-day Saints of Jesus Christ, or LDS, sometimes called Mormonism. The plates were inscribed with a strange language, uh, which he claimed was uh, Reformed Egyptian. Smith then dictated the translation by using a chocolate-colored seer stone, which he placed in the bottom of a hat. He would place the hat over his face and uh, supposedly look through this hat and the stone to the words, and then he would dictate it uh, and translate it. And only he could use the seer stone, so no one else could ever see the special writing in its translation. Only he could. Moroni also told Smith, apparently, that he was a prophet and an apostle and that it was, an, it was now acceptable to marry multiple women. So the young Smith began introducing himself as Joseph the prophet to young ladies. He ended up with 40 wives. In 1830, Smith published a book, the completed translation with the title, The Book of Mormon. To date, over 150 million copies have been published. Smith also published other revelation, including a book called Doctrine and Covenants. This so-called revelation says that Jesus is the Father and the Son, that Jesus is a God, but any Mormon can attain Godhood as well. It also says that Satan and Jesus are brothers. There's a gospel of sorts, uh, which is really a bad news version of the good news, with a list of requirements that you need to perform, that you need to do good works in order to earn your salvation and keep it secure. One of those good works, by the way, is that every male Mormon needs to spend a year of full-time ministry, which is why you see a lot of them with a little badge, Elder Gonzalez or somebody knocking on doors, driving around the neighborhood for a year. And all of this was done because a man claimed to have dreams and visions and a visitation from an angel. Now, did anyone see this coming? That there would be people that would have dreams and visions and visits from angels and come up with a new teaching that would be taught to Christians as if it were Christianity. Did anyone see it coming? Absolutely. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Jude. Jude saw this coming. He saw it a mile away and he warned us that we would be prepared. Now, last week we saw uh, in the sermon about rebellion that God considers false teaching to be a very serious kind of rebellion. The same level of seriousness as the rebe rebellion of unbelief. We looked at the unbelieving descent of some of the Israelites that stood up to the authority that God placed over them of Moses and how God destroyed them. It's also the same level of seriousness as the rebellion of unlawful divagation. We saw that, to, remember, to divigate means to, to leave the realm that you have been assigned, to stray out of your lane. And we looked at the demons who strayed out of their lane when they did abominable deeds that they were not meant to do and that God punished the earth. We looked at Genesis chapter 6 and some other passages about that. We also saw another type of uh, unacceptable rebellion 
unlawful, unnatural desires, the unnatural desires of sexual perversion. We saw that as an example of a type of rebellion against God that's very relevant today. The unnatural desires that people have outside of the, the marriage parameters that God has set. And that this type of sexual perversion is, is a, a very serious rebellion. Now this week, Jude mentions an unexpected problem with the rebellion of false teachers. There's a lot of issues with false teachers that we have seen, that we will continue to see in the book of Jude. And tonight's one is a kind of a strange one. The problem he has with false teachers is that they are insulting, that they insult angels of all people. So let me read for you from verse 6, just to remind us of some of the context. Jude verse 6, And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Yet in the like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the, bo the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Just until there. This book of Jude is a pretty intense little book, and it's full of fascinating nuggets, uh, little tangents that Jude goes on and uses as, as illustrations, quite, quite um, uh, new and, and, and different types of illustrations that aren't used in other parts of the New Testament. And so we learn quite a lot, and today we're going to see claims of new revelation that expose three traits of false teachers. Three traits of false teachers that are going to be exposed by claiming that you get revelation from God. The first trait is that they are insubordinate. Insubordinate. They, they reject authority. Secondly, they are insulting. That They actually insult angels, as we'll see. And thirdly, that they are ignorant. They don't even know what they're talking about, though they claim to. So firstly, let's look at the first uh, claim that, that uh, the first trait of a false teacher that is exposed by claiming that they get new revelation is that they are insubordinate. They don't like authority. Verse 8. Yet in like manner, these people, now the these people in this verse is referring to the false teachers that we were looking at last week. You know, if you were just reading the epistle in one sitting, you would remember that context. Uh, in like manner, just like the other people that were judged and the angels that were judged, these people, these false teachers, also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. So they are insubordinate. False teachers claim to get dreams and visions from God that has new information that you and I don't have in our Bibles. This new revelation from God rejects God's authority. We recognize that God's authority is contained in Scripture. 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us that all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for instruction, and training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So we believe that the Scripture is authoritative, that God's Word is truth. What these people are claiming is that they are getting other information that may contradict even what we see in Scripture. Like what Joseph Smith was claiming about being able to marry as many people as you want, claiming that Jesus is the brother of Satan, that, that you can be a god like Jesus is God. All of those things contradict what the Scriptures say. And yet he said, well, I heard it from an angel. I had it in a dream. I had a vision. So in this way, they are rejecting God's authority. Now, we're not going to belabor the points here that they defile the flesh um, and that they reject authority because we saw that last week. Last week, we focused on the, the rebellion and the sexual perversion, 
the defiling of the flesh, the rejecting of God's authority in all the different realms and the different ways that God punished that. So I'm not going to rehash all of that, you know, just go see last week, read the verses above. Um, but look at this phrase here, relying on dreams. Dreams. So, you know, you, you know what a dream is when you're sleeping, your mind kind of wanders, it's a physiological thing, it's, it's the way your brain processes information, uh, it's the way memories are formed and cataloged. It's, uh, it's kind of like your computer doing a bit of a reboot while you're sleeping. Sometimes you remember your dreams. Sometimes you don't remember your dreams. Um, but there are cases in Scripture where God actually communicated with people by coming into their thinking um, visually while they were sleeping. Uh, one example is uh, Joseph. J Joseph had married Mary, and um, the, when Jesus was born, Herod was going to kill all the babies, and Joseph was told in a dream that he needed to go to Egypt. And then after he'd been in Egypt, he was told in a dream again that now it was time that he could go back. Um, there's another Joseph who had dreams, you know, the one with the Technicolor dream coat um, from the Old Testament, from the book of Genesis, where he had dreams about uh, the seven years of famine that were going to come, you know, the the thin cows eating the fat cows meant that there were going to be seven years of famine after the seven years of, um, of uh, abundance. And so that was interpreted. And so there's this, this uh, revelation that we see happening there in dreams. And in the, especially in the first century world and, you know, really in, for, for many centuries, there have been a lot of superstitions about dreams and that they have meaning, that they have some sort of authority in your life. Um, you know, Freud and Jung uh, and, and all of their disciples teach you in psychology the interpretation of dreams and that if you dream about this, it means that and you know, all these types of things. You see that uh, Pilate's wife, Pontius Pilate's wife, says to him, have nothing to do with this man because I had a dream. I was tormented in my dream about him. So uh, people then see this talking about dreams in Scripture and they hear people saying that dreams have meaning, and so they can come to an audience of people who might believe that and say, well, I had a dream, and God placed this dream in my mind, and it, therefore it is authoritative. And if people trust their teachers too much, meaning that they will trust them even when they lead them away from what God says in Scripture, then you can pretty much say anything you want, and you had a dream about it. Well, I had a vision. I, I, I saw something that happened uh, while I was awake, like a daydream. Remember Peter in Acts chapter 10 was on the roof and he, he went into some sort of meditative trance um, in which he had this vision of a sheet coming down full of animals and the interpretation, you know, and the, a voice told him to kill it and eat even though they were unclean animals. And the interpretation is that now the Gentiles should not be considered unclean. And so this kind of you know, once you open that, that gate to, well, you can have a dream from God and there's an interpretation and it's authoritative, uh, it's very difficult to, to help people stay on the straight and narrow, right? Because, I mean, anyone can have a dream about anything. So we, I do believe, of course, that those dreams were authoritative for Peter and for Joseph, and that's why they're included in Scripture. But we're told by, the, by John, after he got his visions in Revelation, that th those were the final visions, that now you're not to add to this book anymore. Now, these people that Jude is predicting is, uh, are false teachers that are relying on their dreams. This is a very common source of false teaching. It's basically just a person's imagination. Sometimes it's called a vision. Sometimes people get impressions while they're thinking or praying. They think of something vivid, some sort of image, and then they talk about that image as if God had delivered it to them. Uh, there was a, a church in South Africa that had made a decision to um, go to multi-site, you know, where, where the pastor is uh, recorded, li like I'm being recorded now, and um, would be the, the sermon would be streamed to different sites um, all over the city. Now, there's a lot of debate about whether that is the ideal way to do church or not. But what this pastor did was he told his church that while he was walking on the beach, God gave him a vision of a multi-site church and told him to do it. 
Now, can you imagine that? I have a meeting with the elders. We sit down. We're deciding whether or not to do something. And I say, well, I had a dream from God that said we need to do it this way. You know, end of discussion, right? It's just a, it's just a, a crude way of resting control of a discussion, saying, well, I got authoritative uh, information from God. And the bolder you are at making those claims, the more you work your way up in this, uh, the, this type of culture that believes in these things. Now, you may meet other Christians who claim to have uh, visions from God telling them to do certain things. And usually what they mean by that is, in my experience in talking to many friends who are charismatic Christians, they would say that you know, God told them to do something or they saw it in a dream or a vision. What they usually mean is, while they're busy praying about something, they imagine a scenario. I imagine a, a bunch of grapes, and one of them grew really large, and when I ate it, it turns out it was an apple. And so God said that I should switch from Microsoft to Apple Mac, or whatever it is, you know? Like, uh, it's just something that, I mean, I've heard that one before. That's why I used that one. Um, somebody will have a... a an idea. They don't mean that they actually saw it. They don't mean they were in a trance. They don't mean they fell asleep or an angel came to them. They just mean they had an idea. But they put a lot of authority in that, and they, they take that as God's guidance. But basically, when you do that, you are rejecting the authority of God through Scripture. You are saying that what God has given me is not enough. He's not delivered to me that which is sufficient for life and godliness. He has not given me a God-breathed book that will help me fully equip me for every good work, as 2 Timothy 3.16 claims. And, and my good works need to be supplemented with other revelation, that you are not complete if you're not getting this revelation from God. And in, so in that way, you are being insubordinate, and this is a trait of a false teacher. Let's move on to the second trait that we see in verse 8. Yet in like manner, these people also relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. Um, your version, if you have the New American Standard Bible, might say uh, blaspheme the majestic, um, the angelic majesties. Sorry, right? Is that what it says? Angelic majesties. Don't worry. It, it, basically, what the ESV is trying to do with glorious ones, what the New American Standard is trying to do with um, angelic majesties is translate the Greek word doxas. Doxas is a Greek word meaning glories. Um, you know, doxology. It's the word glory is the word doxa in Greek. And so it's kind of a strange phrase that these people blaspheme the doxas. Um, but I think it's clear from the context it's speaking about angels because just before that, He's talking about angels in verse 6. Um, and then in verse 8, he says, blasphemes these glorious ones. And he gives as an example of how not to do that. Verse 9, when the archangel Michael uh, contending with the devil. So here, he's talking about angels and demons, basically. So that's what that word doxus means. The, the glorious ones, the, the, the higher beings, these angels and demons. Now, when a preacher claims that God is giving him rev revelation, he's not only being insubordinate to God's revelation that he has given in Scripture, but he's actually insulting those who brought God's revelation because the preacher is then putting himself on par with those that have delivered God's Word. The, for example, the angels and the prophets. Now, I mean, it's... It, the reason it's insulting is because you haven't earned it. You don't deserve to call yourself on par with somebody that delivers the law of God. It's like, uh, you know, certain airlines, I, I heard that um, certain airlines will give preference, seating preference to doctors. You know, if a doctor comes, it's good to have a doctor on the plane just in case somebody has some medical issue that comes up. Somebody has a heart attack in the mid-flight. They'll get up and say, is there a doctor in the house, right? And so, therefore, on a standby list, if you're a doctor, the chances are that you'll get bumped up and you'll get put on the plane before someone else. Now, imagine I went to the, the uh, airport and I told them, I'm a doctor. 
you know, and maybe I show them on my credit card or something where it says Dr. Archer. Because I want, I want the upgrade or, you know, I want that preferential treatment. And technically speaking, it's not even a lie. I mean, I am a doctor. It's just like I can't help with anything medical. I'm not that kind of doctor. So it's, it's not only the wrong thing to do. It's actually insulting to doctors. It's insulting to physicians for me to insinuate that, well, I'm as qualified as they are. I mean, imagine there was a heart attack on the plane, and they came to me and said, can you please help? I would say, I can certainly pray for this person, but that's about it. Uh, it's, it's insulting to insinuate that I'm on the same level. In the same way, when a preacher claims to have direct revelation from God, you're insulting those that did have direct revelation from God. You're saying that you should trust me the same way you trusted the, the Apostle Peter. The same way you trusted uh, the Apostle Matthew, or the writer of, of Hebrews, or, or Jude, or uh, any of the authors of Scripture, the prophets of old, Isaiah, Jeremiah. And, specifically in this text, you're actually talking about angels. You're claiming to be on the same level as angels, angelic majesties, or glorious ones. Now, you might think, but... <laughs> When do angels deliver the Word of God? And for that, I'm going to just do a quick rabbit trail, just because I found this very interesting in my own study, just to make this point. Um, I mean, I could just say, trust me, right? Trust me, angels were involved in the deliverance of the law of Moses. But the, what I'm trying to teach you is to not trust me, but only trust me when I can show you in Scripture. So let me just go on this little rabbit trail with you. I'm going to read a few verses. Firstly, um, Second Peter, you know, I, I think I mentioned the other day that Second Peter, which is book just before first, second, third John, and then Jude. Um, in Second Peter chapter two and verse ten, so Second Peter is very similar to Jude in its content and even in some of the phrases. And uh, verse nine says that the Lord will uh, knows how to rescue us from trials. Verse 10 says, and especially those who, uh, sorry, and, and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. That's verse 9. And then 2 Peter 2.10, and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. See how it sounds like Jude? Bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. There's the phrase again. Whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. Okay, so I just wanted to draw your attention to the, the fact that these glorious ones being spoken of in Jude are angels, and it's a little bit more clear in Second Peter that the glorious ones are, are angels. Um, and now let me just read for you a couple of verses here. I don't know if you knew this or not, but angels were instrumental in the delivering of the law to Moses. So Moses that wrote the first five books of the Bible, um, those five books came to Moses somehow. Some of it was dictated by God. Some of it, you know, the Ten Commandments were written by the finger of God on a tablet of stone. But much of the law was delivered by angels in some capacity. Now, we don't actually know exactly how those angels did that, but I'll, I'll give you some verses to show you that. Um, firstly, if you're taking notes, Deuteronomy chapter 33 and verse 2 talks about the angels at Mount Sinai. That's Deuteronomy 33 verse 2. Psalm 68 verse 17 also talks about the angels at Mount Sinai with the giving of the law. That's Psalm 68 verse 17. So Deuteronomy 33 2, Psalm 68 17. Um, in Acts chapter 7, when Stephen is preaching, remember Stephen who gets stoned to death? Acts chapter 7, verse 53, in Stephen's sermon, he says, You who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. So there again, talking about the law of Moses. Acts seven fifty-three: You who received the law as delivered by angels. Galatians chapter 3, verse 19. Why then the law? It was put in place through angels. So Galatians 3.19, Paul acknowledges that it was put in place by angels. So Stephen knew the law came from angels. 
Paul knew that the law came from angels. The writer of Hebrews says in chapter 2, verse 1, Therefore we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or dis disobedience received a just retribution. So he's talking about the law again as being delivered by angels. So Acts 7.53, Galatians 3.19, Hebrews 2, verse 2. And then the passage in Deuteronomy and, Acts, uh, and, and, and Psalms all mention angels, connecting angels with the deliverance of the law of Moses. Okay, so all that to say that Jude is saying that when you claim to have laws for God's people or information revelation for God's people, you're putting yourself on the level of angels. And quite frankly, that is insulting to the angels. And then he uses a really fascinating example to illustrate this. Um, meet Michael, <laughs> okay? Uh, meet the archangel Michael. He says here in verse 9, but when the archangel Michael... Okay, stop right there. I mean, how many people have a Michael in their family? You know, I know the Stantons do, um, <laughs> and uh, the Conklins do. And Michael is a common name, right? It's a, it's a name um, that comes from the Bible, believe it or not. Mike is a biblical name. Uh, the name Michael means who is like our God. Mikael, who is like our God. Um, but there's only one Michael mentioned in the Bible, although he's mentioned four times. Now, in Christian art, the archangel Michael is often depicted as wearing a suit of armor. If you ever see, uh, you go to Rena Renaissance section in the, in the museum, you're going to see art of a, a guy with wings and a suit of armor. That's, that's Michael. That's not in the Bible, by the way. Uh, that's just in art. But if you see it, that's, that's what he is. And he's usually seen carrying a sword. And this is why. Let me read for you a few passages where he's mentioned. We, we've just read the one, Jude. I'll read you the three others. Daniel chapter 10, verse 13. There's an angel that's bringing Daniel a message. The angel is three weeks late, by the way. And now when he gets to Daniel with the message, he explains why he's three weeks late. And this is a little Star Wars episode going on here, a war with the stars. Daniel 10, 13, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. Okay, just a little glimpse into angel warfare um, that Daniel prays, God sends an answer through an angel, but this angel is intercepted in space, you know, between heaven and earth. There's this uh, interception, and the prince of Persia, by the way, princes, um, the word prince is often used to describe angels in the Old Testament, certainly in the book of Daniel. So the prince of Persia, this some sort of uh, demon in charge of the area of Persia, because um, there's also the prince of Greece, and you can read Daniel on your own time. Um, he is fighting this angel that's delivering the message to, to Daniel. And, and God, after three weeks of this, he can't get there. God sends Michael to take care of business. And when Michael shows up, he takes care of the prince of Persia, and this guy gets to go to um, speak to Daniel. So I know what you're thinking. When are we going to study the book of Daniel? And the answer is... Not tonight, but um, there, uh, chapter 12 is the other mention of Michael, so let me do that. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. And at that time, uh, this is speaking about the end times during a great tribulation that the world has never seen. At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince, who has charge of your people, meaning the Jews, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. So this is talking about Daniel's 70th week of prophecy, the Great Tribulation. And during that time, part of the prophecy is, Michael shall arise, and he is in charge of the Jews. Just a little glimpse. And then Revelation 12, verse 7 is the other glimpse that we have. Uh, now war arose in heaven. Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. 
And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. So Revelation 12, 7, I think that that's giving us a little insight into what happened when uh, Satan and his demons rebelled. Uh, you know, the angels in heaven decided to become fallen angels, really, and rebelled with uh, Lucifer in heaven. And instead of God just wiping them out, you know, he mobilizes the forces of heaven. And Michael is in charge, apparently. Michael and his angels defeat the dragon and his angels and, you know, the demons. And uh, that's all we know. <laughs> okay, so when you piece these together, what do we know about Michael? A, he's an angel of some sort, right? He's an angelic being. B, he is called here the archangel. Arch just means, um, the word arc refers to um, highest or the one with authority. So he is an angel over other angels, which makes sense because in Revelation 12, it says Michael and his angels, doesn't mention anyone else by name, just Michael and his angels. And, um, and so we know he's an angel. We know he's an archangel, so he has some sort of authority. We know that he is the angel in charge of the Jewish people. I don't know what that means. They're guardian angel of some sort. Um, and that's pretty much all we know. You can see why people imagine him wearing armor and having a sword, right? But it doesn't say any of that. Okay, now, you can also understand why over the centuries there has been a great fascination among Christians with the forces of darkness and the, the cosmic battles between angels and demons and what, what part do human beings have in this? Um, the short answer is none. Uh, you need to stick to your pay grade, okay? But um, there is this fascination with angels and certain sects within uh, Christianity and history have even extolled angels and prayed to angels, venerated angels in some way. I remember as a child, I was given a little prayer card um, to keep in my Bible, and this, it was a picture of Michael, the archangel. Um, I've also seen Christians rebuking Satan, binding demons. Have you ever heard of that um, binding of demons? It's, it's something that's quite prevalent in certain Christian circles and charismatic. Some charismatic churches will teach that just like the apostles had the power to heal, we have the power to heal. And then they'll also say because the apostles had the ability, the power to cast out unclean spirits, demons, therefore we do too. And so what that looks like in reality, if you've never been to one of those churches, is that sometimes while the pastor is busy praying to God, he will suddenly start praying to Satan. Now, I know that sounds weird, but it'll sound something like this. Yeah, you know, and uh, Father God, help us today um, to focus on what we're going to hear in the Word. And Satan, I bind you in the name of Jesus. And Satan, I cast you out of here. And demons of distraction, be gone. And they start talking to demons in the middle of a prayer to God. Uh, in case you're wondering, that's not okay. You, when you're praying to God, you pray to God, and you never pray to anyone else, okay? You don't talk to demons, you don't talk to Satan, you don't rebuke him, you don't bind him. The reason they talk about binding is because um, it, uh, Jesus says that you can't, you know, you can't plunder the strong man's house until you have bound the strong man in the context of why he's casting out demons. So people say, we need to bind the strong men and the demons. There was a, a lady friend that I had in college, and um, she had a, a dorm room. And one day, her dad came when she was moving into the dorm room, and I was there, and I was helping them move some furniture in. And the, before we moved anything in, her father walked around the room to each corner and bound the demons. Um, the demon of laziness, so that she would study hard. Uh, the demon of distraction, so she'd be able to con focus on her schoolwork, and the demon of impurity. And I could have sworn he looked at me when he prayed that part of the prayer. I don't know. But uh, anyway, he cast out the demons. He bound the demons in the room so she would have a safe room. And I remember thinking that was pretty strange. But this is part of that culture, right? Now, I've seen uh, teachers like Miles Monroe do this, Ed Raybert, Rodney Howard Brown, um, and even the youth pastor at my high school 
used to bind demons and pray over us, casting the demon of lust out of us young men and things like that. Um, Jude wants to make it clear that that is not something Christians should be doing. And he says it this way, that he uses this example. The archangel Michael, verse 9, when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. So Jude wants to contrast how brazen false teachers are to address angelic majesties and address demons when compared with how cautious the angels themselves are, even the archangel Michael wouldn't say to Satan what many people in the pew say to Satan. And you might be thinking, wait, what? <laughs> what was that about the body of Moses? Uh, was I absent from Sunday school that day when my um, Sunday school teacher was putting up the flannel board of uh, Michael and and Satan fighting over the body of Moses, what is going on there? No, you didn't miss anything. That is a story that is not recorded in the Bible. And yet Jude, bringing it into Scripture here, we know that this is something that happened. This was an, an oral tradition. This was a, um, a story that had been passed down but was not recorded in the, um, in the Old Testament. And there were lots of these stories going around, and some of them may have been true and some of them weren't. This is one of those that was true because Jude refers to it here as, as fact, as something that happened historically. Now, what happened with the body of Moses? Um, let me read for you from Deuteronomy chapter 34. Deuteronomy is the last book of Moses, the last of Moses' five books. Chapter 34 is the last chapter, and this is recording the death of Moses. And remember that because Moses disobeyed God by um, hitting the rock when he was told to speak to it, God said, well, then you, you're not going into the promised land. So in Deuteronomy 34, verse 4, the Lord said to Moses, this is the land which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. I will give to your offspring. And I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not go over there. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him, meaning the Lord buried him, in the valley, in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor. But no one knows the place of his burial to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was undimmed and his vigor unabated. <laughs> Sounds like that was really important to Moses, that that part was recorded. I might have been old, but I wasn't wearing glasses, and I was still as strong as a 20-year-old. You know, my vigor was unabated, and my eye was undimmed. It was just, it was my time at 120. Now, you might also be asking, how did Moses record when he died? <laughs> well, Moses, well, there's two theories. The one theory is that God revealed this, you know, dictated this to Moses before he died so that it would be written in. But I think that um, Joshua finished off the book of Moses. That's kind of what uh, church tradition has told us, the, the, the book of Deuteronomy, that these last few verses were penned by Joshua, which also goes to explain why Joshua would say of Moses, this, he was 120 years old, but his, his eye was undimmed and his vigor unabated. Uh, and it goes on to record the next 30 days of mourning as well of the people. So obviously Moses didn't write that. Um, unless God dictated that to him. Okay, anyway, but my point is this, verse 6. God buried him in the valley of the land of Moab. So why did God not want Moses' body to go into the promised land? No, I'm asking because I don't know. Um, <laughs> it doesn't tell us. We don't know why. I mean, one theory is that, you know, people revered Moses so much that if they had his body, if they had his bones with him, that that would have become an idol that the people would have worshipped, or something like that. Who knows? Um, it appears now, from the book of Jude, that it may have had something to do with what Satan wanted to do with the corpse of Moses. Maybe Satan wanted to dishonor this great man of God in some way, um, embarrass him, or do something with the corpse that would have been uh, degrading to Moses and his legacy and his memory. And so God sends Michael to protect the body of Moses. 
Maybe it was Michael's job to be the one to actually bury him. He's buried in a place that nobody knows so that his corpse would remain safe from whatever Satan wanted to do. So we don't want to speculate too much on what that might have been. The point simply here, if you go back to the book of Jude, is that while this was happening, as the story goes, Satan was fighting against Michael for the body of Moses, and Michael didn't say, I bind you in the name of Jesus. Well, there you go, done and dusted. Now, why didn't he do that? Wouldn't that just be the easiest thing to do? Satan, I cast you out. Now he's gone. Now I can carry on burying Moses. No, you can't do that because he doesn't have the authority to do that. Neither do you, by the way. You don't have the authority to do that either. Um, but what did Michael say? Did Michael, you know, cuss him out? Of course not. Michael is a holy angel. Does Michael rebuke him himself? Not even that. Not even that. When the archangel Michael, verse 9 says, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment. Blasphemy there just means speaking against, railing against someone. But he said, the Lord rebuke you. The Lord rebuke you. Fascinating. By the way, we see this happen again, um, or as well, in Zechariah chapter 3, verse 2, I believe, uh, where the angel of the Lord rebukes Satan and says, the Lord rebuke you. So if you ever meet a demon and he wants to talk to you, A, my first advice would be run quickly and far, far away. Okay, don't, don't talk to the demon. But if you do have to talk to the demon, this is, this is an example of something that is appropriate for you to say. The Lord rebuke you. You don't have any authority over demons. You don't have any authority over Satan. You can't tell Satan to be bound or to be cast out or to go here or go there. You are never told anywhere to talk to Satan. When Jesus was talking to Satan in the wilderness, when Satan appeared to him and was tempting him with Scripture, Jesus quoted Scripture back to Satan. If you ever feel like you're in the presence of some sort of darkness, I would commend to you, quote Scripture. Quote Scripture, pray to God, don't talk to demons. So here we see an example that is insulting to angels when you think that you're above their pay grade. You think that you can talk to demons, you can talk to Satan in a way that not even the archangel Michael himself would presume to do. Okay, so that's the second point. The third one will go a bit quicker. Uh, they're insubordinate, they're insulting, and the third trait that is exposed by their claim to receive um, revelation from God is that they are ignorant. Verse 10, but these people blaspheme all that they do not understand. And they're destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. People go, who go around addressing angels and demons and claiming that they're in touch with God and the spirit world are playing with fire that they don't even know about. They're like monkeys poking at an electrical socket. It's, they're just dabbling with something way too dangerous for them. And they don't even know. You, these people who claim to know about how demons work and how the spiritual realm and what you need to do, and they don't know what they're talking about. They have the same Bible you do. If it's not in here, where's it coming from? Well, a lot of people will say, well, I've had experience with demons. You know, the Ghostbuster Brigade. Uh, experience with demons. Listen, the only thing we know about demons is that they lie all the time. <laughs> They're dirty, rotten scoundrels. Don't believe anything a demon ever tells you. So it's crazy for people to think, well, I know about demons because they, they told me, you know. Fred Dickerson is, is uh, somebody who wrote a book about this. And he said, this is a quote from Fred Dickerson's book, I queried the demon regarding his undercover mind control, and he admitted to controlling the brain through electrical and chemical changes. We have power in that, was his confession. Again, we do not take this as scientific evidence, but his confirmation of controlling the mind through the brain must be considered. Why would he give away such damaging information except he were under pressure from the Lord? Unquote. Fred Dickerson claims to have heard from a demon, by speaking to a demon-possessed person, who told him some information about how demons operate. And Dickerson's response is like, well, why would he have told me that unless God was making him tell me? 
Or maybe he's a demon who's lying to you. Why are you believing a demon? Don't believe anything demons say. I'll give you one example from Scripture of people who were, you know, way out of their pay grade dealing with demons. Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, where the seven sons of Sceva were um, trying to copy Paul. You know, Paul was casting out demons by the power of Jesus, and they thought, hey, maybe we can do this too. So it says in verse 13, some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists, these are like wannabe ghostbusters, undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. I mean, they're not even Christians. They don't even know Jesus. I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, I'm not going to put on a demon accent, by the way, but I imagine it being a deep voice. <laughs> Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom, the evil spirit, in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. That's what you get from messing with a demon. These people are trying to cast this demon out by... You know, the Jesus that Paul proclaims, and the demon's like, I know Paul, and I know Jesus. Who are you again? And then this guy, this demon-possessed man, beats up all seven of them and strips them naked. By the way, you often see nakedness associated with demonic manifestations. The demons strip the people that they are possessed with, um, take the clothes off of them, the, the sign, even through through fashion and pornography and all these ways, uh, the, the uncovering of the human form is something that demons want to do. And here you see it. Here the demon is ripping off the clothes and beating these people to make a point that he doesn't answer to them. So, so again, who do you think you are as a human being doing this? Well, the reason they're doing it is because they don't know any better. Isn't that what Jude says? He says that they... Uh, these people blaspheme, verse 10, all that they do not understand. And they're like unreasoning animals. Unreasoning animals acting by instinct. A logea zoe. Um, logia here referring to logic, reasoning. A logia means no reasoning, no logic. They're just like animals. They're just dumb animals. I mean, when a rat is in your ceiling... And he sees a little, a little block of wood there with a little piece of cheese on it with a, a big metal thing in the background. The rat doesn't think to himself, I wonder how cheese would get into the ceiling. This smells funny. There's, there's something going on here. Why would there be cheese in the ceiling? Maybe I should stay away from that. Rats don't reason. They see the cheese, they eat the cheese. And they get killed. And he's saying that's exactly what you are like when you're dealing with a demon. It doesn't occur to you that, wait a minute, why would I be the one having to deal with a demon? You know, isn't that Archangel Michael's job? Why am I the one that has to do this? Who am I that, with this authority? No, no, these people, they don't even think like that. They're just binding and casting and ghost busting and think that, woohoo, they just got this with their seminary degree. Unreasoning animals. They're not thinking straight, and it's dangerous. Application of you in the pew, you might not be one of these false teachers. You might not even have seen one of these false teachers. That's good for you. But let me tell you that dabbling in anything in the occult is dangerous. And often teenagers get exposed to this at school. You need to be training your children to stay away. Often kids are drawn to um, things like seances, uh, Ouija boards, uh, necromancy, you know, channel channeling the dead. And 99% of all of that is just a hoax anyway. It's just, uh, it's folly. But, but even the small part that may be true, whether it's a hoax or not, it, the Christian response is to flee from it. Not to be curious, not to dabble, to flee. To stay pure. Because it's dangerous. And it's insulting to the angels whose job it is to go and take care of that stuff, not yours. And you're being ignorant. And you're being insubordinate. These are three points. 
So, what do the angels think about Mormons? Angels think Mormons are insubordinate and insulting and ignorant. So, is this what they think about everybody who dabbles with angelic majesties? Now, how do you evangelize people in that situation? Or how do you deal with all of these things? You bring them Christ. Christ is supreme over all. All you need to know is Jesus Christ. If you are in Jesus Christ, you are safe from all of this demonic activity. If you are in Christ, you have the Holy Spirit in you, which is greater than anything in the world. So come to Christ even tonight if you're not. Turn to Him. Repent of your sins and embrace Him, and He will save you, and you'll be safe from all of this. And if you want to know about some more of Satan's tactics, tune in next week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this reminder that there are forces beyond our understanding and beyond our control. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to be humble, uh, that we would recognize those who are not, those who are acting in a way that is insubordinate and, and ignorant and insulting to the angelic majesties, and that we would not um, give them our attention, but rather that we would direct our attention to the truth of your word. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, I went a little long for Wednesday night, so I will take one or two questions if there are any coming in. Um, if you have texted in any questions, let's have a look. Um, here's one. This is a question about um, elders and deacons, qualification for elders and deacons. Can a single man serve in the role of elder or deacon, assuming that he meets the other requirements as well? Because it seems that the passages are saying that if a man is married, he should be faithful to his wife and not have multiple wives. Um, let's see. Since it would seem the same logic would have been applied to having kids, and not all families can have kids. Um, also, Paul and Jesus were not married and would obviously be qualified. Yeah, so uh, what that question is referring to is in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Um, also in uh, Titus chapter 1, there's a list of qualifications for elders. I'll look at the one in Timothy. Um, and one of the requirements in 1 Timothy 3 is that if you're going to be an, an elder, an overseer, um, you know, he must be above reproach, and he must be the husband of one wife. So I think what the question is referring to is that some people say, therefore, if one of the qualifications of an elder is that he must be the husband of one wife, then a single person cannot be an elder because he's not the husband of one wife. So they're saying you have to be the husband of at least one wife <laughs> and no more than one wife. But that's not actually um, a good interpretation because it's not a good translation. Uh, the best translation of that phrase is a one-woman man. And as the question points out, um, Paul was unmarried. Um, Jesus was unmarried. Uh, being married isn't part of the qualification. The point is that if you are married, you are a one-woman man, as opposed to a married man who, you know, has a wandering eye. If you were a single man and an elder, the way that would apply is that how, you know, how pure are you in your dealings with um, members of the opposite sex? And are you a guy that is constantly dating around and has a whole bunch of different girlfriends? That would not be uh, a good sign of your your ability to be a one-woman man. So there are applications there. But no, I, I don't think that that would be a disqualifying um, trait. Just like, as the questioner says, um, it talks about having your household under control, children who are submissive. Uh, does that mean that you can't be an elder until you have children? Uh, well, no, not everybody can have kids. That's not a disqualifying thing. Again, the whole point of that is that if you do have children, uh, are you able to deal with them the way you would deal with people in the church? If somebody is wayward in the church, do you just let them go wayward? Or do you shepherd them back? Is there church discipline? Are you able to, you, you, the way you shepherd your family is a microcosm of how you would shepherd the church. Um, I had uh, some other questions that came in a little earlier. Um, one was a, a relevant question if you've been following the devotions on the creeds. Um, in the Apostles' Creed, one of the lines is, that uh, Christ um, suffered, died, and was buried. He descended into hell and rose on the third day and ascended into heaven. And the phrase is that descended into hell. They were asking about that. Why is it that Christians believe Jesus descended into hell? Well, 
you need to understand that the Apostles' Creed, which is the oldest of the creeds, um, not written by the Apostles, but based on their teaching, uh, wasn't written in English. It was written in Greek, Greek and Latin. And the word there uh, used is Hades. And Hades is a word that refers to the realm of the dead. Like in the Old Testament, the word Sheol means the realm of the dead. Um, for example, in Luke chapter 16, the story of the rich man and Lazarus, it says that the rich man is in Hades and he's in torment, and that um, Lazarus is in Hades, but he is in Abraham's bosom, a place of honor and comfort. So Hades just meant they both died. They both went down to the realm of the dead. So when Jesus died on the cross, the Apostles' Creed was stressing that he actually died, like he, his spirit separated from his body, and he went to the realm of the dead. Now, we know from other passages what actually happened at that time is that Jesus went to paradise, what we call heaven, because remember, he said to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise, not in 40 days, you know, when I ascend into heaven, but today you'll be with me in paradise. And um, also, we know from, from uh, what we looked at last week from Jude and Second Peter that Jesus, sorry, First Peter, Jesus went down to proclaim victory over the spirits in prison. So in that sense, yes, he did descend into where the abyss is, what the New Testament calls Tartarus, um, a part of Hades, to declare victory, but only momentarily as he was on his way to paradise. He, Jesus did not go to hell to suffer, to be tortured for any reason. He did not have to be at the hands of Satan to pay for our sins. Our sins were a debt against God, the Father, not Satan, and that God's wrath was completely appeased by Christ's atoning work on the cross, and that was all completed when Jesus said, it is finished, tatalesta, it is finished. And then he yielded his spirit. So there was no punishment after the moment that Jesus died, but he did go to the realm of the dead completely. So that's what that means.